the Gospel of John, chapter 12. I want to start reading for us from verse 23, the response that Jesus gives to the disciples after the Greeks have come seeking an audience with Jesus. Jesus answered the disciples, those who were around him, he answered them from verse 23, and he says the following. It's wonderful to hear a church full of people paging in their Bibles. It's a wonderf wonderful in our Bible studies as I'm privileged to sit at the back of the Bible studies for these past couple of weeks to hear you flip the pages of your Bibles. So it's a joy to my heart. From verse 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven came from then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said it was it had thundered, and others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show but by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that, when you, become, that you may become sons of the light. <clears throat> Only so far may the Lord bless the reading of his word. As we saw in the response of Jesus to his disciples, he was preparing them for his death. In verse 24, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So Jesus is speaking of the hour that has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And as we continue in John 12, we start to see that the Son of Man is going to be glorified, particularly here in His death. Particularly in His death. And so the hour that Jesus is talking about, the hour that has come, is the hour of His approaching death. That's why in verse 27 we find Jesus saying, Now is my soul troubled. Now is my soul troubled. Jesus telling us, Telling his disciples at this particular point in time, his soul is troubled or agitated. It's pulled this way and that way. Here is a sign of Jesus Christ's true humanity. Though he is God in the flesh, he is also truly man. And as truly man, his soul is troubled for what awaits him. And so his soul is agitated and he makes it known to those around him. My soul is troubled. How wonderful to know for us who have experienced something like this when our soul is troubled at something that's coming. And we wonder what shall we do? That sort of trouble and anxiety over shall I go this way? Shall we do this? This is the same trouble and agitation that Jesus felt in his soul. And he asked, and what shall I say? So the agitation of his soul is between two points. What shall I say? What shall I do? 
Where shall I fall? What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Father, save me from this hour. What is Jesus considering on the one hand here? Father, save me from this hour. And then on the other hand, he is considering, but for this purpose, I have come to this hour. So for us who know about Jesus' coming death, this is what Jesus is referring to. Father, save me from this hour. Father, save me from this hour. What does Jesus mean when he cries to the Father, save me from this? Isn't this the same as when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, O Lord, if, is it, if it is at all possible, let this cup pass from me. If it's at all possible, let this cup pass from me. O oh, Father, save me from this hour. The anguish and the pain of Jesus' soul here is because of His coming death on the cross. Now think of your own cry. The cry that you and I have when we are convicted of our own sin. We also cry something like, Father, save me. But for us, the cry is, Father, save me from my sin. Our anguish of our soul comes from our own sin. But then we look at Jesus and we see Him as the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. And what brings anguish to His soul is not the anguish of His own sin that He's going to suffer on the cross. But when he prays, Father, save me from this hour, we must realize that Christ is praying this because he knows that he is carrying the sins of the world to the cross. This is the anguish of Jesus' soul. He has taken the responsibility. By his wounds, we are healed. He who was innocent. He was not going to suffer on the cross for his own sake. Here is the anguish of our Lord. He's willingly going to take this responsibility of dying for his people. How many times has it happened to you that you say, yes, I'll take a certain responsibility. And then as you take that responsibility, the weight and the burden of that responsibility starts to weigh upon you. And then at a certain point you say, I can't take it anymore. I just want to be released from this responsibility. I think it's been the experience of many of us. I think Jock experienced it this morning with the family Bible class perhaps. You were teaching and taking a certain responsibility and then the pastor asks a difficult question. And the heat is on. And then you say, I wish someone else was standing here. But you see, we understand this in a small measure. We understand this anguish in a small measure. The anguish of having that responsibility. And why would we carry through this responsibility? What do we need to be reminded of to carry through our responsibilities? We need to be reminded perhaps of those whom we love and whom we're doing it for. But sometimes when we point to those whom we love and we look at them and we say, is it even worth the trouble? It's like a parent saying, I've told you for the thousands time that frustration with people. What I'm doing doesn't seem to have an effect on the ones that I love. And so where is Jesus drawing the attention here? When he said, now is my soul troubled, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. And then he says, Father, glorify your name. Father, glorify your name. You see, he's not looking horizontally to the sinners he's about to die for, because at this point it's their sin that's causing him anguish. And to look at them, he might start to wonder, is it worth dying for them? Will it have any effect? If it sounds like I'm making up stuff, please turn to Isaiah 49. And make sure that I read from Isaiah, not like last week when I said Isaiah and I read from Jeremiah. I'm sorry. So anyone listening to that recording, if I say Isaiah, I was reading from Jeremiah. 
I meant to read from Isaiah. So Isaiah 49 is in the section of the servant songs where the servant of the Lord is made known to his people. And so from verse 1 of Isaiah 49, Listen to me, O coastlands, give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother he named my name. This is the servant speaking here. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother he named my name. He made my mouth like a saw, sharp sword. The Lord who called the servant has made his mouth like a sharp sword. So just remember this whenever you hear the words of Jesus in the Gospels. His word is a sharp sword. And we get that picture of Hebrews that talks about the two-edged sword of God's word piercing to the division of bone and marrow. Able to discern the thoughts and the intentions of man's heart. So when Jesus speaks, he speaks directly to our hearts. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me away. This is the picture of a warrior who's made ready the bow for a specific enemy. And he's making it particularly sharp. To pierce a particular target. In other words, the servant has been prepared by the Lord for a specific function, for a specific task. And verse 3, And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, So God said, You are Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But the servant, Israel, here responded, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. I labor in vain. This is how he feels with regards to the labor that he is doing. But then the comfort comes in that same verse with the word yet. You see, we must realize how close, how close Jesus was to just putting it all aside and saying, no, thank you. Don't want to. But didn't. We must understand the anguish of the soul of Jesus in carrying that responsibility for our sins and how he freely took it upon himself and how He expects of us, His people, when He calls us to faith and repentance, to no matter the anguish that it's going to cause us to follow Him, to say, glorify Your name. To overcome that anguish and that pain and that suffering that comes along with following Jesus, and to commit ourselves zealously to continually follow Him. Because he committed himself to the utmost to die for your sins. But where does he turn his eye? You see, yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. You see, in this moment of anguish that we find in John 12, Jesus does exactly that. Father, save me from this hour. My soul is troubled. I don't want to die on the cross. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. For this purpose, I have come to this hour. And you see, the purpose for which He has come to this hour is not first and foremost your salvation. It's first and foremost the glory of the name of God. These two things cannot be separated. Too often in today's world, people think that salvation and the glory of God's name is divorced. And that's why we don't understand the holiness of God anymore. Because people have made the gospel all about the saving of souls. But the gospel is concerned also with the glory of God. 
They're inseparable. They're two sides of the same coin. The glory of God and your salvation tied up together. But don't think that your salvation comes at the cost of the glory, the holiness, the justice of God. This is what we need to learn and grow in and understand about the gospel. Going back to John 12. Father, save me from this hour. You see, you and I today can cry, Father, save me from my sin, because Jesus, though He felt it, though He was troubled in His soul, though He was in anguish, He didn't say, Father, save me from their sin. He could have said that. He tells us he considered saying that. What shall I say? You see, so what Jesus is doing is showing us his heart. He's showing us his heart. I really don't want to die for your sins. Can I say that I think that? Can I say that I think that? Isn't this the same kind of honesty that we should be having in our relationships with one another? Husband toward wife, wife toward husband, parents toward children. I really don't want to behave like a responsible parent to you at this moment because you're, you're behaving as an irresponsible child. But yet I'm going to behave as a responsible parent not because of who you are but because of who God is and His glory. Can you see what Jesus is doing? He's showing us exactly what we pray for when we pray, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Father, save me from this hour. But yet, for this purpose I have come to this hour, so gladly accepting the responsibility that comes with dying for our sins. So you must see the freedom of Christ to take our sins upon Him. You don't lay your sins on Christ. He takes your sins and He took your sins to the cross. He's not begging you to give your sins to Him. He did. He took it. He took it to the cross. We must understand that the cross of Christ is not merely about the bodily agony that awaits him. It's not just that his body is going to suffer many bruises, but it's his soul that is going to be in anguish because of sin. And some of you may know the term, some of you may not, but here we talk about the imputation of sin, imputed sin. And we must understand that imputed sin means it is a sin that is reckoned to. Our sin was reckoned to Christ. It was imputed to Him. Your sin was laid upon Him. And then you say, but how, but why? We must then start to understand that in the first place, when Adam sinned in the garden, the first imputation of sin took place when Adam sinned, we all sinned. Adam's sin was imputed, reckoned to us. God looks at you as if you were Adam who ate of the forbidden fruit in the garden. Because his sin is reckoned to you. Romans 5 verse 12 tells us, Just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Not because Adam sinned, but because all sinned. Adam sinned and so all sinned. And right here is when in Sunday school the young kids start saying, but that sounds unfair. That sounds unfair. I didn't eat the fruit, Adam ate the fruit. If I were in Adam's shoes, I wouldn't have done that. But then how do you know if you were in Adam's shoes, you wouldn't have done that? Because ever since your birth, you've been doing things like that where you disobey God. There's no proof that you would ever do anything different than Adam. 
There's no proof that anyone would do anything different than Adam. If you were in a courtroom appealing to it's unfair, well, present your evidence. Present your evidence. You see, so we must understand that Adam is the head of humanity. Adam, as the head of humanity, our representative head, sinned and so all sinned. Humanity sinned. Everyone sinned. And so if Adam's sin is, then is imputed to all men, we need a Savior to take the sins of humanity upon Him. So our sin, the sins of humanity, then is imputed to Christ. That's the second imputation then in the redemption that takes place. As Adam's sin is reckoned to us, so now in Christ our sins need to be reckoned to Christ. Our sins are imputed to Christ. This we see in Romans 5 verse 17 and following. For if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. And then also verse 20. Excuse me, this is 2 Corinthians 5 from verse 20. I'm going to read all the verses and then start to unpack them. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20 to 21. The apostles say this, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making His appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. And you remember Galatians 3 verse 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, as it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. So from these verses that we've just read from 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 especially, for our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin. That's talking about the imputation of our sin to Christ. He didn't sin. He didn't sin. He's innocent. The truly sinless man who doesn't deserve for sin to be imputed to him, but yet willingly takes that sin upon himself and the Father laying that sin upon him. Our sin imputed to Christ made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, when we talk about imputation, we shouldn't just talk about the imputation of sin, the reckoning of sin. We're also, in the same breath, talking about the impu Im imputation or the reckoning of righteousness. Look at that in verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 5. For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, the, the problem with us is not only that we sin. It's not only that we're unholy. The, the problem is we also lack the positive righteousness, the positive goodness. And how do we get that? You see, it's not just Jesus forgiving all of our sins and now we're right with God. If He's forgiven all of our sins, we haven't yet at one point done anything that is righteous and good, that which is expected of us. You see, forgiving of our sin just makes the account zero. 
but you need a positive bank balance. We just don't need our accounts zeroed because what do we do when our accounts are zeroed? We just go back into debt. We need to have a positive righteousness. But where does that positive righteousness come from? And you see, it's just as our sin is imputed to Christ, reckoned to Him, so we are reckoned righteous in Christ. His righteousness is imputed to us. Romans 5 verse 17. If because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. The free gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So it is through Christ that this free gift of righteousness reigns in the life of the Christian. But to have this sort of relationship, we need to be united to the Savior, united to Christ. We need to be in Him. Now you can understand what is meant by this exchange. It's not only an exchange and you go your way and I go my way. It is more of an exchange like take my right hand and take my left hand and we're united. And we only gain this in close relationship with Christ. You can't Take the blessings of Christ and go have it somewhere else apart from Christ. Gives you an idea of why the Savior is willing to go through with this. Because He just didn't die so that you can live your life. He died so that you will be one for the glory of the Father. So that your righteous life will bring glory to the Father. And this is his hope, isn't it? In verse 24 of John 12, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. You see, you might have thought of that verse when you hear Jesus saying something, Father, save me from this hour. You might think, but Jesus, you just said, Jesus, you just said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. You see, this is what prayer is like. This is what prayer is like to remind the Lord of His own promises of what He said. Ours is a relationship with the Lord. But you see, we lack the relationship with the Lord because our response oftentimes is we get tired of this relation with the Lord and we tell Him something like, but you can't do that. You can't feel this way. You can't feel, Jesus, you shouldn't feel this. Father, save me from this hour. You see, we, we like to prescribe to God in our relationship with Him. And that's a problem. Because who are we? Who are we to prescribe to God what He can and cannot do, what He can and cannot feel? And how do I know that we tend to do this with God? Because I know that we tend to do this also with one another. How frequently do we say, but He can't do that, or He shouldn't do that, He can't think that. But what if we start to see these feelings and thoughts of people as merely part of their personhood? And start to think, maybe it's legitimate for him to think this way, to feel this way. What would lead him to think and feel and do this way? But then also to, like Christ, reminded himself of the glory of God and reminded, no doubt in his mind, knowing what the purpose of his death is, and what it will accomplish, verse 24, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Just think about the fruit of dying to yourself. 
instead of being offended with another person, think of the fruit that can be gained by dying to yourself and giving up your rights in the relationships and saying, well, okay, he's behaving this way. Maybe I should respond in this way or behave in a different manner. So instead of being frustrated with our relationships as if we're constantly butting heads, ask yourself this question, not how can I change the other person, but asking yourself, how can I behave differently? And not just behave differently on the surface, but how can I behave differently from the heart? How can I show this person I love you and so I'm going to behave differently? Because isn't this what Christ has done? He's not looking at us and saying, hopeless, they'll never be one for righteousness. He looks and he says, for this purpose I've come into this world. And look at where Jesus puts his trust. In Isaiah 49, he says, my recompense is with the Lord. In verse 28 of John 12, he says, Father, glorify your name. He speaks to the Father. He trusts the Lord for the fruit. He trusts the Lord. He has faith in His Father to produce the fruit through His obedience to the Father. Can you see the wonderful relationship between the Father and the Son? God the Father. God the Father sending His Son. And the son willingly obeying, obeying even to the point of death, death on a cross. In order to gain much fruit for the kingdom of God. To win the souls of sinners to his father for, the, for his glory, for his purpose. So that when we are saved, when we are saved, we cry out, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. You see, that is why Jesus came to die on the cross. So that you and I can worship and glorify the Father in heaven. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The Father speaking from heaven here. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Now just as there were some in the crowd who didn't hear the voice, who didn't understand what was going on, and some heard the voice and were speculating as to who was speaking, so even today there are those who believe it to be and those who don't understand. Verse 29, the crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Some of you may leave the church here today saying, oh, the pastor was just on about a lot of things today. He just thundered from the pulpit. He just made a lot of noise. The voice from heaven didn't land on the heart of some in the crowd. Others said it, an angel has spoken to him. An angel has spoken to him. In verse 30, Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Jesus is saying, in other words, I know that the Father will glorify His name. I know that the Father is committed to this. This voice has come for your sake, not mine. This voice has come for your sake, so that you may hear it, so that you may know the Father has glorified the Son and will glorify the Son. And this then is the Father from heaven attesting, in other words, that Jesus Christ is truly God. For God in Isaiah says, my glory I give to no other. And here the Father openly glorifies Christ. And just as there are today many of those who 
believe Christ to be God and there are those who believe Christ just to be another man, just another prophet. So in this day, it is still the same. Jesus answered, this voice came for your sake, not mine. Now, in verse 31, we find this word again. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. We understand also then that when Christ says, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Considering the imputation of our sin. But now also in verse 31, He's not only taking our sins to the cross, but He's bringing judgment to this world. Now is the judgment of this world. And now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And this is where we start to think, I cannot compute this. It doesn't make sense. But what Jesus is saying, in other words, is when He is hanging on that cross and the powers of hell are thinking we have victory because He's dead, is the very point at which the rulers of this world have been cast out, rejected. Through the cross of Christ, he not only dies for our sins, but He also conquers death and all the powers and authority that thought they had the victory. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. How do I know it's talking about His death? Verse 32, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. When I am lifted up. When I am lifted up. And how do we understand this to be the cross? Because we think lift up the Lord in worship. And we have a different picture. But we know from the Gospel of John that when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, He told Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever looks upon Him may have life. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to Myself. We already know from John chapter 6 that Jesus said, No one can come to Me unless My Father draws him. How is it that the Father draws us to Christ? It is exactly through the cross of Christ, I, when I am lifted up to the earth, will draw all people to Myself. Here is the persuasive power of the Gospel. The persuasive power of the Gospel comes in power, the power of Christ's death on the cross. Not in words of eloquent wisdom. Not in reasoned arguments. Not in nice PowerPoint presentations. Not in long lectures. But it's in seeing the crucified Christ. Isn't this what Paul says to the Galatian church? Is it, he was portrayed as crucified before your very eyes. To the Galatian church, he tells them. Paul tells them, in the preaching, Christ has been portrayed as crucified. You see the power of God. And this is how He draws people to Himself. In verse 33, He said this to show by what kind of death He was going to die. He said this to reveal to those who were there by what kind of death He was going to die. And so in verse 34 then, the crowd answered Him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Can't help but seeing the crowd here as those who come with their Bibles and then they say, but this verse says this. But this verse says that. But what about this verse? But what about this verse? 
You see the crowd answering him. We heard from the Lord that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? You see, the Scriptures are not meant to discredit the words of Christ. You cannot use the Scriptures to discredit the words of Christ. But Christ does not entertain this line of conversation. He doesn't start debating but the law this and the law that. He simply responds in verse 35. Jesus said to them, the light is among you a little while longer. Walk while you have the light. Walk while you have the light. What the crowd are doing when they come, we have heard that the law of the, from the law that Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? We must understand that Jesus Christ in His ministry has been expounding the Scriptures, has been declaring Himself to be the Son of God, has been showing and demonstrating and teaching His disciples from the Old Testament who He is and the things pertaining to Himself. And then there are still those who come and they say, but here, but there. They're arguing with the teacher. Here is the point then. Christ is the teacher of the Old Testament. Christ teaches you your Bible. Don't disagree with the teacher. Don't fight with Christ the teacher over what He tells you is in His Word. Let Him be the teacher. Be the pupil. Don't try and teach the teacher. Don't try and teach the teacher. And Jesus is showing He won't be taught by them. He's, he's, he's the one doing the teaching here. And so He responds, The light is among you for a little while longer. He's talking about His own walk in the flesh, before His death and ascension. The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. If I can paraphrase in a more direct way what Jesus is telling them, come out of the darkness. Your response shows that your mind is in darkness. Though you have your Bibles open saying, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever, your, your mind and your hearts are darkened. So Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light. So see these two things together. Verse 35, walk while you have the light and believe in the light. These are the two appeals that Christ makes to the crowd. Walk in the light, believe in the light. Believe in the light so that you may become sons of the light. Walk in the light so that the darkness does not overtake you. His response to the crowd, in other words, is you're not converted. You're not believing. He's, he's simply saying, repent and believe. Repent and believe. You see their question, how can you say? They're asking of Christ, how can you say? And he's simply telling them, repent and believe. Repent and believe. Isn't this the response that God gives us when we also ask that question? God, how can you say? How can you say? What's the response that God gives to us when we ask Him that question? Isn't it the same response as it's always been? God's faithful response. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Trust in God. 
While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. You see, what's keeping us from becoming sons of the light? What's keeping them from becoming sons of the light? It's their own understanding. It's their own darkened minds and their own darkened hearts. What keeps us? It's our own darkened understanding. From Jeremiah 13 verse 15 to 17. This is one of the Old Testament themes that Jesus was picking up on when he taught, taught them to walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. Just reading from the Old Testament, Jeremiah 13 verse 15. Hear and give ear. Be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. Isn't this what we're talking about? Be not proud. Lord, how can you say? Hear and give ear. Be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. What does away with our pride is God speaking. Verse 16, give glory to the Lord your God before He brings darkness. Don't look for your own glory. Don't look for your own understanding. Give glory to the Lord your God before He brings darkness, before your feet stumble on the twilight mountains. And while you look for light, He turns it into gloom and makes a deep darkness. But if you will not listen, listen very carefully to verse 17. When God says, if you will not listen, God doesn't say good riddance to bad rubbish. Listen to what God says. My soul will weep in secret for your pride. God does not shed tears openly. He terrifies in His anger and in His wrath. But He tells us secretly He weeps. When God openly pours out His wrath upon sinners, know that this is the heart of God, that secretly He weeps. Just as a father sometimes has to deal harshly with his children for the sake of the lesson, but when he's dealt with them, crying in a secret corner because of the heart of his children. So God weeps. And even more than that, more perfectly than that father ever could. If you will not listen, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. Hear the call to us today from Paul as he writes to the Ephesian church. Ephesians 5, verse 1 and 2. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. We know love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Walk in love. Walk in obedience. It's the same thing. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So what, what makes it so practical is when Christ said, save me from this hour, He said His soul was in anguish, save me from this hour, but yet for this hour I have come, willingly laying down His life for us. That should be the greatest motivator for you and for me. That's the motivation of the Christian life. Walk in life, love as Christ loved us. The, the cross of Christ is a display of God's love for you and for me. And so as He loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God, 
What would it look like if we were to love others? It means nothing other than to take up your cross. Take up your cross. Follow Christ. Because it's in your death that you bring the most glory to God. And it's not just the death when you go to the grave. It's the death when you consider others' needs above your own. You take yourself out of the equation. And what I mean by that is not, separ but not considering your own feelings and wants above what is needed to be done. Not saying, I don't feel like it. I don't particularly feel like it. We are so fickle. We shouldn't be. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. Walking in love, walking in obedience is the same as walk while you have the light. Walk in the light. In verse 7 of Ephesians 5, Paul says, Do not become par partners with them, with wickedness, with the evil ones. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. While you have the light, believe in the light. So that you may become sons of the light. And when you've become sons of the light, walk as children of the light. You see, you don't just become a child of the light and then you walk as however you want. That's why Paul reminds us in Galatians 5 verse 25, If we live by the Spirit... Let us also walk by the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, meaning if you have gained life in Christ by the help of the Holy Spirit, if He's made you alive, if you rejoice in your salvation, let us also walk by the Spirit. Walking here means your way of living. Your way of living from the heart. If you have life by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit. But here is the implication. If you're not walking according to the Spirit, it is a proof that you do not have life according to the Spirit. If you don't walk according to the Spirit, it is evidence that you are not alive according to the Spirit. People who live, who are alive according to the Spirit, will walk according to the Spirit. One flows out of the other. So let us walk in the light. Let's close in prayer.